Thanks for joining us this afternoon. So uh, my, I'm Richard Taylor. We've got this water loss uh, training event, two day event happening today and tomorrow. And so the people in the room are here for two days and we've had a good session, uh, good day so far. So this afternoon, um, I'm gonna basically do a presentation in, in three parts. They're roughly half an hour each. The last one's a bit shorter. There might be some time for some questions from the floor. Um, and so basically, Part one, I, I'm, because I wanted this to be almost for a lay person to understand about water losses and the problem with percentages, etc., I'm, I'm starting with a pretty general introduction to water supply systems, so it'll be pretty familiar with you people in the room, but for others watching it might not be. Um, I'm going to just talk about the water balance uh, for a little bit, which basically explains where the water goes once it leaves a water treatment plant, and then talk about performance indicators for um, real water losses and mainly why percentages can be so misleading. Uh, part two, I want to talk about supply risk and capacity issues, uh, talk about some economic considerations and why water losses are important. And the third part, I'll, for those, um, just to cover fairly briefly at a fairly high level, um, just what's involved with managing water losses. We're talking water losses, which is leakage from a, a public water supply network. And just summarise the key issues uh, from all three parts, and then there'll be a few suggestions. So, why do you have? A, why do we have a water supply system at all? And obviously, we all know that uh, having a safe and adequate supply of water is, you know, fundamental to public health. We all need to drink clean and safe water. And community or central water supply schemes are generally will provide a safer and more reliable supply of water than private supplies, and that's because you've got large-scale treatment, you've got quality control, etc. Uh, whereas if you've got a roof tank, um, sure it's water and it, you'll probably be okay, but you know, there's the possums on the roof, etc. It can, the quality is not really controlled. So if you're running a community or public water supply system, what are the key levels of service? Well, obviously we want the water safe, so we'd want to meet uh, the Ministry of Health standards uh, in New Zealand. People, supply, flow and pressure are two key uh, levels of service for, for households and, and customers. So for, for residential type supply, we would have 25 litres a minute and 250 kPa, which is 25 metres head at the metre. Uh, is fairly standard in New Zealand, I'd say, and also fire service uh, flows from fire hydrants. And bes besides getting a, a reasonable flow and pressure, uh, we, we want good continuity of supply, right? We want the water to be on, you know, 99% of the time. We don't want the water going off every second day because uh, it's very inconvenient. And um, so basically we want a reliable network and we also need to respond to faults and complaints pretty promptly. So we've got to get out there. People, people expect a, a good response and for faults. And they, then they expect backup supplies and for, for the supply to have thought through redundancy of supply and providing a reliable and robust supply. So just here's a typical water supply. We, we've got a, a source, which is the, um, the river in this case. We've got an intake and a treatment plant here. Uh, the treated water, uh, there'll be a contact tank here, but it gets pumped up to a reservoir here and a reservoir over there, two reservoirs in this town. And all these blue lines on the map, generally in the road reserve, are water mains. And that's what you'll see on a council ge geographic information um, system and the network is basically we refer to all these pipes and the roads delivering water to customers in the network. So basically we we have for a typical water supply system we have a source which could be river lake, storage dam, a bore, uh, we have a bit of infrastructure to get to a treatment plant with water treated to a good level and then there's a contact tank often where, where chlorine has to react with the water and then we pump water and then we get into the network where there's water mains, storage tanks as in reservoirs, uh, pump stations, valves, hydrants, service connections, etc. And um, this treated water, water leaving the treatment plant, from now on most of what I talk about in terms of losses is treated water once it's left the, the water treatment plant. So, what, so these are the types of pipe that are used for water mains. Um, the PVC has been around since um, probably the, the late 70s and 80s. Uh, polyethylene, which is this sort of blue pipe you see quite commonly. Ductile iron and concrete line mild steel uh, pipes. So these are still used 
um, in construction today. There's some polyethylene down there as well. Some of the older types of water main that are in the system and starting to give problems because they're getting 50, 60 years old now are asbestos cement or commonly known as AC. Some older types of polyeth polyethylene um, yeah, which, which have been superseded by a better formula in the, in the material. Uh, cast iron pipes and galvanised iron pipes. So some of these are, are old. Some cast iron pipes have been in the ground for like 100 years and still performing well because they're strong. And uh, just the insides need cleaning out every now and again. And just some of the key components you get in a, in a water network are valves. So the smaller valves tend to have a handle. These larger ones have a, a key. Oh, that's a hydrant, sorry. Have a key to operate. Like that, that's a valve. This is a hydrant, so the firemen and, and service people screw a standpipe into a hydrant which is in the ground. Here's a standpipe. That hydrant is down in the ground on a T off the water main, and that's how hydrants operate. Service connections are constructed by putting a tapping band around the water main and then having a pipe come off that to the property boundary. And there's different types of water meter. And there's a shot of a bit of a construction. You use a bit of a Meccano set, you bolt it all together and you put it in the ground and you, um, you pressure test it and then you sterilise it, make sure the water's safe and you connect it up to your uh, live network. And generally there's two, two main scenarios for supplying water to a, to a town or network. One is having a service reservoir on a hill. So if there's a hill nearby at the right elevation, you can pump the treated water up to a reservoir and then the water the gravity feeds into the, into the town. Where there's no hills, like the Canterbury Plains, <laughs> basically you take water out of the ground, a bore, and there'll be a pumping station, a, a, a tank, storage tank and a pumping station, and the water is just pumped 24-7 into the network. So it just relies on uh, pumps operating continuously. Another, another key point with the water supply is what we call the point of supply. Where does the public network interface with the private network? And in New Zealand, it's pretty much at the property boundary. Irrespective of whether there's a water meter there or not, basically that is the interface between public water supply and private water supply. And obviously you can get, wet. I'm talking about leaks on the public network, most of what I'm talking about today, but you can get leaks on this pipe and have leakage inside the house as well. So I want to talk about, so if we're going to talk about managing water supply so we don't run out in these times of climate change and unusual um, weather patterns, uh, what, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to understand um, where the water goes once it leaves the treatment plant. And there was this national project uh, I was involved in back in 2002 and 2008, which was called Bench Loss, which is, it's, um, it adopted the International Water Association Water Balance, which you'll see in a minute which basically gave us common terminology and internationally recognised performance measures for water loss. So this is what we call the, the International Water Association Water Balance, the IWA Water Balance, and it's used all around the world. Even the Chinese are using it now. And so basically it's, it's, a, it's been adopted internationally and these terms were all agreed. So basically, very briefly, um, the water leaving the treatment plant is represented by this volume across here. And basically some of that water could be exported to a neighbouring council or neighbouring water supply. But, but the water that basically goes into the water network is this yellow section here. And basically water is either sold or it's not sold. So water that is sold to customers, it might be the neighbouring council, it might be a build metered connection where there's a water meter and people pay for the water they use uh, that as recorded on the water meter, or we have, uh, in a lot of New Zealand, we have unmetered customers, so there is no water meter on the property boundary. So basically people would pay a uniform annual charge and just use the water that they, they need or decide to take, and basically um, there's no meter there, but, they are, but that is revenue water because they're paying for the water effectively. So that leaves us with some items of non-revenue water, and we have some Authorised consumption, which is used like by the fire service and, and for maintenance. We, uh, the balance down here is, is really water losses, and that there are two sort of components, apparent losses and real losses. 
And so parent losses have, there are two types really, unauthorised consumption. So this is theft of water and it could be metre tampering or metre bypassing. Uh, it could be tankers filling from hydrants without telling anyone. Um, basically theft of water. Uh, this, this line item here is very important because it's customer metering under registration. Because for these metered customers, uh, most of the water meters, most of the customer water meters in New Zealand will be mechanical meters and they tend to read a bit slow, especially as they get older. So, for example, if 100 cubic meters of water goes through a meter to a property here, um, the water meter may only read, say, 98, and the other two cubic meters falls into this category, so it's actually a volume of water. A water balance is normally done over a 12 month period and it's a volumetric calculation. So we calculate volumes over 12 months. So basically, the default value for this is 2% of water build. So basically, for build metered consumption, you assume that on average, customer water meters are reading 2% slow. And that's a component in the water balance. Now, if you work that out and you work all these out, what you're left with is what we call real losses, which, is, uh, which are real physical losses. So these are small leaks, large leaks, burst water mains, uh, overflowing reservoirs, etc., up to the street property boundary, up to, up to that point of supply we, we saw. So basically we're talking about real losses on the public water supply network. And here's a, an example of a, of a fairly simple water balance where you've got a volume of water supplied, a volume of metered consumption. In this case there's no unmetered. Uh, that's non-revenue water is the difference. And then we've got some default values for those, the, some of these minor items. And then once you deduct those, uh, you're left with a volume of real losses for the system. And like I say, typically over a 12-month period. So these are, the, these are the factors where we get have information. And often you're left with, you have to assess this. And what you assess here um, determines the level of real losses. So there's a, bit, there's a bit to doing that and that's why we're here. One of the reasons we've got this water loss training seminar to help us work out what's happening. This diagram is not the scale. Typically for, for a lot of New Zealand this would be 60% of water supplied would be billed unmetered consumption because it's basically going to all the, all the households. And so this diagram is not the scale. And real losses are typically um, well, in New Zealand, anything from 15% to 30, 40, I've even seen more. So there can be some high levels of losses around. So once you've done a water balance, you know, looking at volumes over a 12-month period, you end up with a volume of, of real losses. And basically, you can calculate some performance indicators. And so it's commonly used as a uh, percentage is commonly used. In other words, this volume over this volume a percentage so we'll say oh they're, they've got 20 percent water losses well I'll, let's just look into that a bit better uh, look and l let's look at some alternatives so really what's recommended internationally is for um, an urban uh, an urban area where the connection density is 20 per kilometer of main which means that on average the water connections are sort of 50 meters apart or closer on average so for an urban type setting it's best to express those real losses in litres per service connection per day. So that is, so you take that volume of real losses, you divide it by the number of connections, and you divide it by the number of days, and you've got the, public, the losses from the public system expressed in litres per service connection per day. For, for a lower connection density, rural type systems, you can use this cubic metres per kilometre of main per day, which is more relating losses to the, to the length of the network. And there's this infrastructure leakage index that I'll talk about as well. But percentage non-revenue water or percentage losses doesn't feature as a recommended uh, water loss performance indicator uh, internationally. So here's some data from the Water New Zealand National Performance Review uh, for medium and large systems. And it's basically current annual real losses in litres per property or per connection per day. So that's the recommended indicator, right? And so you'll see that basically um, this is for the last five years and basically that's zero, 100, 200, 300, 400. Basically we're, we're looking at one to 200, maybe the bulk are between say 100 and 300 
um, litres per connection per day. So uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later, but that, that is quite a lot of water, isn't it, when you think about it. The infrastructure leakage index I just mentioned was, it's really, it's just a performance indicator, it's a, it's a ratio. And it's a ratio of what your losses currently are, divided by what they could be with, really with first class water loss management. And there's a formula to calculate uh, what we call unavoidable annual real losses. And it's, it's a fairly simple formula based on the length of water mains, the number of water connections and the system pressure. Basically, you can put that those three parameters in, and you'll get a volume of what is a low level of losses for a first-class um, water loss management. And basically, we talk about ratios, which is this infra infrastructure leakage index, which is really um, what you're currently, what the system is currently losing, um, divided by this unavoidable factor. So here. The Water New Zealand also collects this information in uh, infrastructure leakage index for um, a lot of the networks throughout New Zealand. And so, um, yeah, this is the Water New Zealand National Performance Review. And so basically you'll see here that 0, 2, 4, 6 and 8. So basically we've got some systems between 1 and 2. There's quite a few systems through here between 1 and 2, which is basically a relatively good performance. And then we've got other ones that um, aren't as good and then we've got a few that are very high. So that's pretty typical. And um, if we just look at what, what that really means in that this gives you some idea, we're a developed country, here's those bands with an infrastructure leakage index, one to two, two to four, four to eight, etc. Probably in New Zealand this is an average pressure is probably 50 metres, maybe 40, but basically these are the litres per connection per day um, that that sort of represents. So in New Zealand, you could say that real losses up to 200 litres per connection per day could be considered acceptable. I mean, we, in a lot of places there's plentiful water and it's pretty cheap. Um, and so if there's availability and you've got the capacity to supply it, um, but that's, that's 200 litres per connection per day. It's, it's quite a lot of water, isn't it? So remember that's the volume of real losses divided by the number of connections and the number of days. So it's expressed as litres per connection per day. Less than 100 is a low level of water loss. So, and you can get down there and um, you can see. Um, so, uh, so is this a surprise? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it's, it's quite a lot of water, isn't it? I think. So I want to talk about the problem with percentages because generally the media use percentages. So you'll say, oh, in Christchurch, it's, they've got 20% losses. And then maybe they'll say something about water care or some other place. And so um, part of me wanting to do this presentation live stream was to try and, anyway, try and communicate uh, a bit wider what, um, what the problem is with percentages. So here's a very simplified water balance diagram. And let's say that um, system input was 100 cubic metres and you're billing 75. Could be, could be metered or unmetered, doesn't matter. That's billed. And let's say that real losses are 22 cubic metres. And then this is and non-revenue water. Percentage non-revenue water is 25%. The percent real losses is 22 over 22%. So that's, that's what happens. Now, if, if a big uh, a wet industry comes to town and all of a sudden this has increased, that's gone up from 75 to 95. But if our losses are the same, all of a sudden non-revenue water has dropped to 20.8%, even though the level of real losses hasn't changed. And conversely, if, if, if the water industry, if the, the wet industry uh, leaves town and this decreases, all of a sudden you're up at 30%, 31% non-revenue water, and yet nothing, the, the, the level of real losses is unchanged. And that's why percentages are a bad performance indicator. So there they are side by side, with it increased, with it decreased. So you can see, you can see the, um, you can see the problem with percentages, but we all, we all love percentages and we'll still use them and, and I'll be talking, <laughs> I'll, I'll use percentages later on in my talk because it is useful, but just be aware that, um, you know, variations in consumption will affect it and I'll, and I'll go on to explain how consumption can vary and it's, um, it's quite, quite interesting, I think. 
So we will use it, but just be aware. And it's, it's not really fair in the media to say one town's got 20% losses, another one's got 25, another one's got 15, because it could be totally misleading. So what affects consumption? Hot summer, wet summer. People use a lot of water in a hot summer. The weather's bad all over Christmas, New Year. Water consumption's down. Water restrictions will affect water use. There's a call goes out to reduce water use, so water use reduces. A large wet industry in town, um, it arrives or, or, or it leaves. Unmeted customers tend to have a high water use. So if you're talking about Christchurch or Wellington or somewhere, unmeted residential compared to sort of the North, Auckland North, um, which is all fully metered, um, the, the, I'll show you a slide in a minute. The, the variation in water use is huge. Vacant properties, some batches, they sit empty most of the year, very low consumption for most of the year. Uh, some might make up for it because a whole lot of people will go and stay on the, on the property and use a lot of water. Um, but consumption varies. Council summer irrigation use at parks. Water conservation programs, encouraging people to use less water. Now this is also from the water New Zealand National Performance Review results, average residential water use. So here we have, here we have Auckland at about 160. And there's other, um, that's, that's not unusual for this part of New Zealand and North where we've got water meters. But here's, here's, here's 300, 400, 500, 600. So you can see, um, just a quote, I think Christchurch is in here somewhere, around 300. So basically, some towns in New Zealand use twice the water that they do in, in the top of the North Island. And so they've got twice the consumption, so you get huge differences in consumption. So in terms of household, can easily range from 400 litres to 1,200 litres per household per day. That's the annual water use divided um, by the days. Comparison using uh, percentages is unfair. Industrial water use, um, I do a water balance in a little town and basically percent real losses, which is the DIA measure, 19.4% real losses. But if that dairy factory shut down tomorrow, it would go to 25.5 overnight, simply because a factory closed down. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the level of real losses in the system. So I hope you can get, get, get that. Reducing customer consumption. Waitakere City, who I worked for, uh, for 22 years, in the 1990s, residential water use reduced from 190 to 160 litres per person per day, probably over about eight years or something, as, as uh, the price of water went up. There were a number of reasons. We, we um, and, and basically we're Echo City, we, we um, were re encouraging reduced water use. So hence, even to maintain a given percentage of non-revenue water or percentage real losses required a significant reduction in the level of real losses just to keep up with the reducing consumption. So I've got some graphs. Here's a graph that demonstrates that. So let's assume our water losses are unchanged over 10 years. So here's years 1 to 10. Let's say they're about 13% or something. Here's non-revenue water through here, which is mostly real losses. If build consumption is reducing over time, your water supply is reducing accordingly. And here, th th this is actual numbers that I've put on a spreadsheet. So here's your percentage non-revenue water. It's gone up from 15% to 17% simply because Consumption has reduced a bit over the years. Now here's another, here's another problem with percentages. And I do water balances at, at a city where water consumption jumps around a bit from year to year. So this is, this is exactly what happens. Basically, let's say your losses are unchanged over 10 years again. But because of um, summer climate variations, etc., you've got your build consumption is jumping up and down. Water supply varies accordingly. And, and look at your non-revenue water. So if you're tracking percentage non-revenue water or percentage losses, pretty much the same thing, um, basically how do you explain to, explain to someone it's gone from 15% to 19% percentage real losses? But, but, but the leakage has stayed the same down here. So that's why it can be very well. In terms of a performance indicator, it's very poor for one organisation one organization to try and track uh, percentages because you have a lot of explaining to do because it can jump around with consumption. 
And here's the scenario where a large customer leaves town and vice versa when if a large customer arrives in town. So the message I wanted to get across this afternoon was really that um, you've got uh, using percentages for real losses can be very misleading and it's, and it's quite unfair. And the best performances for, for real losses are litres per connection per day for urban areas, uh, metres cubed per kilometre main for rural areas, and for comparing between systems, the infrastructure leakage index is, um, is good. It tells you how well you're doing at the pressure you're at. So using percentages is unfair and misleading. The percentage of real losses uh, can and will fluctuate year to year with changes in water consumption. Uh, percentages will be used, they'll always be used, and can be useful, but be aware of the limitations. And so the, the DIA performance measure to uh, percentage real losses is, is definitely um, problematic for the above reasons. So for urban systems, litres per connection per day, and for and real losses up to, in New Zealand, real losses up to 150 to 200 litres per connection per day uh, may be considered acceptable at less than 100. is definitely achievable in most systems um, if you put in the time and effort, and that it would be good performance. For rural systems, use this, and the infrastructure leakage index of less than two is, is relatively good performance. So that's the end of the first part. So are there any questions just from the floor? Yeah, I had one. Mm. Um, you're saying that 200 litres per connection per day is acceptable as leakage, but that's looking at the leakage in the reticulation, not the customer's leakage, is that right? That's correct. That's expressing, it's expressing this component of the water balance. So you do this volumetric calculation over 12 months, and you end up with a volume in here, a volume of water, because you've got that volume and you've deducted all these volumes and you end up with a volume of water and you're dividing that volume of water, if it's a 12 month water balance, you're dividing that by 365 to get per day and you're dividing it by the number of connections so you're getting, and you're getting it in litres. So you're expressing that volume in litres per connection per day. So it's sort of like, so say, say let's, let's, take, let's say 200 litres per connection per day. It's, it's roughly, say, a, a person's water use. You could say a person might use 200 litres in a day. So it's effectively like an extra it's an extra person living in the house is basically what's being lost on average in the public water supply network. Oh, that's private gear. So any leaks, any leaks um, on private property is part of consumption. So that should be included. That's included in here. So yeah, so leaks on the, on the private plumbing, the pipe from the boundary into the house, and leaks inside the house is all consumption 